Good afternoon and welcome to the third family workshop with the one and only Dr. Collier. Today's topic is about the brain and technology. And as luck would have it, we had some slight technical difficulties, so we apologize for the delay in getting started tonight. But we are so um, excited to have Dr. Collier with us to explore this really important topic as we all find ourselves using technology more than we ever imagined. So um, please remember that we will be recording the session tonight. And so if friends weren't able to come or attend, they will have access to this recording. And there's also an opportunity for those of you who did join us tonight to be able to um, be entered into a raffle for her book, which she'll share with you a little bit later in the presentation. So with that, I'd love to pass it off to Dr. Crystal Collier. Great, thank you, Barb. I'm really happy to be here with you guys again. I have done a lot of research on 18 different high risk behavior and how they affect the brain. And so let me share my screen so that we can talk about the particular presentation that I have entitled Screen Time and Social Media. So it is all about the brain. Let me just make sure, oh, translations are working. Looks like we are good. Okay. Let's start off with my favorite quote by my favorite brain researcher, Lawrence Steinberg. He said, a teenager's brain has a well-developed accelerator, but only a partly developed brain. When I read this, I was really curious about what he was talking about. What's the accelerator and what's the brake? I quickly learned the accelerator is our limbic system, the fight flight survival part of the brain. And it is fully mature by the time we're 11, 12 years old, which makes a lot of sense because by the time we're 11, 12 years old, we're out in the world and we should be able to take care of ourselves pretty well, especially as we learn how to individuate, push away from our family and start to create our own identity. Now, we need a lot of courage to do that. So the limbic system does. And we also need kind of to get uncomfortable with our parents so we start pushing away and individuating. Limbic system does all that for us. But the part of the brain that is the break, that's the prefrontal cortex or frontal lobe that's not developed until 24, 25 years old. But our generations today are born into technology without a prefrontal cortex that actually can control impulses to stay at a high risk behavior, to use technology in balance. So we have to be their frontal lobes until they grow one of their own, especially when our kids are going through the second phase of brain development, which is from 11 to 25, when hundreds of thousands of connectors are connecting brain cells together. Now, Let's take a deep dive into specific parts of technology that are changing and reshaping our brain that parents really need to understand before they actually give a kid technology or when you need to learn how to balance it for them when there's not when they're not. So I've got some use it or lose it challenges for you. I think there's about six or seven in here. The first one is how many hours do our teens, specifically our I generation, which is our millennials and our Gen Zs, spend looking at a screen every day? There have been a lot of studies done on this. I'm a generation Xer, and I was 13 years old when the internet was born. Our millennials, though, spent about five to six hours as they grew on technology. Then the smartphone was created in 92, and our Gen Z spent about seven to nine hours. What I'm hearing is that we are clocking 11 to 12 hours on a screen during this last year of pandemic. This is changing our brain. And when a survey was done a few years ago, asking Gen Zs, the millennials and the older Gen, uh, the Gen Zs and the, the uh, younger millennials, are you concerned about technology use? They said, yes, 60% 
of the kids who took the survey between 12 and 17 said they think their technology uses a problem. Over half of them believed they spent way too much time on their cell phone and 41% were worried about the time they spent on social media. But of course, taking their tech away, oh my God, it's like someone died if they do that. So I'll answer any questions that you guys might have about when to or how to or if you should take away certain technology. A lot of parents are worried that if they take it away, they might ruin a child's social life. Let me here be the one to tell you, you're not going to ruin your child's social life if they don't have their technology. You actually will make it better, but we'll talk about that as we go. How is technology rewiring our brain? This is use it or lose it challenge number two, and we're gonna start off by revisiting our use it or lose it principle. Remember you guys that the brain grows based upon the neurons that you're using, and in between the ages of 11 and 25, you grow so many hundreds of thousands of connectors. One brain cell is connected to 10,000 others, and those connectors are happening during that span of time. Now here's what it looks like. You guys have seen this picture before. It's a magnified picture of an infant's neuron. You've got all these things that look like tree branches and roots. Those are the dendrites, the connectors. And when our children grow and develop, and this slide is just up to age two, but when they do, we get long networks of connectors. Every time you learn something new or practice something, you grow these connectors and that makes your skills so much more uh, in depth and greater. So here's the deal. We have learned that if you engage in an activity for three or four consecutive hours, one after the other, you learn your brain changes. You grow those networks. So let's apply this brain science to what we're doing for three to four hours at a time. If you want to get really good at soccer, practice for three or four hours a day. You want to get really good at debate, do research and argue for three hour, four hours a day. If you want to get really great at Fortnite or TikTok, yep, I think you're getting me. If you engage in these behaviors for three, four or more hours a day, you're going to grow long strings of neurons for doing these things at the expense of learning how to do the other things. So one of my favorite rules that I wrote about in the book and that research really bears out is we need to have a balance rule. So if your kiddo is online for two hours, the rule is they got to get off and do something else with their brain for two hours. Balance it. We'll talk more about that at the end. So this is a picture of an internet cafe in China. Technology has affected Asian countries for about 15 years longer than us just because they've been more technologically advanced than we have. So we have had a lot of time to study all the negative effects from the research that has come out of these countries. And what we know is that technology has changed these countries so much, they actually have to have painted walkways which designate technology and no technology because people are literally walking out into traffic and suffering debilitating accidents because they won't look up from their technology. But hold the phone, you guys. Can you guess what American city this picture was taken in? Washington, DC. But if you've been to New York lately, well, maybe not lately, but before the pandemic, you may have seen these. We'll probably see them in Houston pretty soon as this unfortunately will happen more and more. The more tech addiction, the more we will suffer some physical issues. But let's do a deep dive and look in the brain. This was an amazing study that illustrates those connectors and when they get connected and when they don't. So two, uh, two groups were studied. They put them in different brain scans to look at the connectors in the brain. The first group of adolescents that participated actually was on their computer for just a few minutes to a couple hours a day. If you connected all the red dots, you would see their brain connectors. 
all over in a really nice pattern all over the brain. This is what we want to see. Those connectors should be connecting all parts of the brain. The second group of adolescents that was tested dropped out of school and went to the internet cafe for 12 or more hours a day. All they did every day was play video games or surf the internet or just engage in technology use. Now the purple lines indicate their brain connectivity. And what you notice is if we're looking down on the brain, which is this second picture down here, there are a lot of really dense connections right there. That must mean they're using that part of the brain a lot. Remember the principle, use it or lose it. What are those parts of the brain? Well, this is the sensory and motor cortex areas. That's the part of the brain they're using the most. But the scary part is look at how many connectors they have into their frontal lobes. Minimal connections compared to all of the other connections of the healthier adolescents who balance their time across the brain and throughout their activities. This is scary because as these kids grow up in age, they get to 24, 25. This is what's going to be in there. If they peak at a certain level of brain connectivity, they will plateau there and that is all they will have as they grow and develop. Okay, let's take a look at what else we're losing. One of the things that's been critical that we're losing is our imagination because we don't just daydream. Now, if you've ever been writing or working on a task and you get stuck and you don't know how to solve a problem, you know that if you just put it down and allow your brain to think about all kinds of other things, it will actually help you solve that problem or get you unstuck. We don't do that as much anymore because we're so plugged into our technology that we don't just sit around and daydream and do nothing anymore. And so our brains are always on and unfortunately not thinking as much outside of the box. We got to give our brain some brain breaks. Another thing that we're losing is our memory, but different types of memory are being affected. The first one is the memory for your navigation skills. Okay, I don't know if you guys remember these, but I had key maps when I was growing up. My key map in my car was so dirty by the time I threw it away because I, you know, I, I lived in the box 491. I knew exactly where I was. These are called spatial skills, S-P-A-T-I-A-L. If you can orient yourself in space, and figure out where to go, you actually create neurons in your brain that create a map for your world. If you've ever moved to a different place, you know it's kind of frustrating until you create that mental map. Well, we're not creating that mental map anymore because we use GPS. <laughs> we are so reliant upon that. I actually had a call from an 18 year old client a couple years back hysterically crying. Her parents were out of town and she couldn't figure out where she lived. She was literally about a mile from her house, but she was so dependent upon her GPS that when she got into a neighborhood she didn't recognize, she panicked. We can't do that to our kids. Make sure they know how to get home and that they're not always reliant, you either, on GPS. So sometimes just get in your car and go. Memorize the streets, memorize the stops, and make sure your kids do too. The next thing we're losing is literally the size of our memory bank. So this is a really cool picture that shows the hippocampus. It actually shows both of them on both sides of the brain, but it's this kind of almond shaped organ inside of our limbic system that stores all of our memories. And anthropologists and people who do autopsies across the globe are seeing our hippocampus is getting smaller. And it's not because of age or disease, as this picture shows. This picture shows the size of a normal hippocampus at 25 and what it looks like at 75 in a normal healthy person. This is what it looks like in somebody who has early dementia at 75 and then somebody who has Alzheimer's. You can see the damage in their memory. But what we're seeing and what we're hearing is that our limbic system looks, excuse me, our hippocampus looks more like these two on the right. 
with no impairment. We're just simply not using it, so it doesn't get packed with all those cells and connectors. The scary thing about that is that we are relying on the cloud to keep all of our memories. I mean, you probably hear it from kids. Why should I memorize this? All I have to do is Google it. Ah, that's kind of scary. If the cloud keeps all of our collective memories, what if the cloud goes down? Well, we have to learn all of our history all over again. I don't know. You get me started on that conversation, we can go down a long way. But let's look at another way that it's affecting us. We are definitely losing our attention span. There was a hilarious study that started in year 2000 when they took an average attention span of kind of your average American adult and found that on average, we have about a 12 second attention span that we can focus on something for 12 seconds before getting distracted. The researchers repeated this study in 2018 and sadly we lost four points. We lost four seconds. Now, the researchers made a really funny point. They said that your average goldfish has an attention span of nine seconds. And so we actually don't have an attention span as long as a goldfish. Now, I'm a little suspect about this because I really want to know how they were able to measure a goldfish's attention span. <laughs> but I think the point is made, and you probably all feel this, that your attention is not what it used to be, but it's not ADD. It's just lack of using it. Attention actually has practice effects. That means the more you use it, the more long strings of neurons that you will have in your brain for paying attention. And that's why it is definitely worth having your kids read for certain long periods of the day to focus and pay attention when they're doing their homework to make sure that you get all the distractions out of their way so they can grow long strings for paying attention. Now, another memory issue that is affected is our good old working memory. Now, I want you to imagine that you have this little juggler inside of your head, and that juggler is your working memory. He can juggle seven bits of information at a time, but that's all he can juggle. This is why a long time ago when phone numbers were seven digits long, it was pretty easy to memorize them. But as soon as they went to 10 digits and added that area code, it almost became impossible because it overworked our working memory. Now what our working memory does is it holds information in space just like that little juggler. And if we really, really, really need to commit something to memory, we focus in on it, we figure out how to relate to it in a way, and then we dump that information into our long-term memory. And all we have to do is retrieve it later. But today we have so many different things that are competing for those seven bits of space that a lot of times we just don't memorize things anymore because we can't focus long enough in our working memory to commit it to memory. So this is how it's affecting learning. Imagine that you've got a kiddo who's in class. They're reading a online website. They've got a book open. They're writing a term paper. They're putting lots of the information into their working memory, juggling that information so that they can synthesize it into a sentence. But ding, they get a text message. They get distracted. They look down and they can see the text message. But then when they move their attention back to the screen, huh, hold on a second, I got to put all those balls back in the air into my little juggler. Like, what was I doing? Uh -huh. Kids lose, on average, nine minutes of learning when that happens. This makes a great scientific justification for taking cell phones out of the classroom. So if you've got one of those great teachers who makes your kid put their cell phone in the shoe rack on their door, please make sure you send them lots of apples and appreciate them because they are doing your kid a strong favor by allowing them to pay attention and focus in class. OK, you guys, let's switch, switch gear a little bit and I'm going to give you use it or lose it challenge number three. How is technology affecting our health? I think the most obvious thing is 
as most of my meals are actually done right here in front of my screen, unfortunately. And so I don't get out and get active as much. Our poor muscles are atrophying. There's other ways. It is causing near sightedness. More people than ever before in history are being diagnosed with something that we call myopia, near sightedness, because your eyes and the muscles in your eyes and the strings of neurons in your brain for seeing are actually getting shorter and shorter and shorter for distance because we're using our near sightedness to see our screens. And it's causing a lot of prescription glasses out there. <laughs> Unfortunately, what we're also seeing is that it is affecting our mental health. My favorite technology researcher, Dr. Twenge, wrote a book called iGen. All she does is research how technology is affecting each generation, and our poor iGens are suffering with more depression, more hopelessness, meaninglessness, and suicide risk than any other generation that came before them. And Dr. Twingy and other researchers are pointing toward lack of face-to-face -face time as the culprit. Now, I think you guys know that when you're with someone in person and they are staring at, at your eyes, that it does give you a dopamine spike because it's good, it's healthy for you. I can't see any of your faces right now, and so I'm not getting that. And when you've got kids who do this all day long, neither are they. We are really not quite connected, even though it's a global digital village, but our depression rates are going up as well as anxiety rates. Anxiety caused by technology is a little different though. Instead of disconnecting you, it hyper connects you and it keeps your brain a little bit on edge, looking for the next thing to do to see. Researchers are calling this a constant state of insufficiency. And boy, I tell you, I really relate to this because when I go out of town on vacation and I know that my emails are piling and piling and piling, I come back to 100 emails, I'm in a panic. I'm anxious. I can't ever finish them. There's no bottom to my email list. There's always another game to play, a show to binge watch. There's always more dot, dot, dot. So kids are never feeling like they're finished. I don't think just kids, I think all of us adults don't ever feel like it's over. Job well done, now relax. And so we can see these in examples like from Snapchat. Now, some of you guys may love Snapchat. I just want you to know on the record, I think Snapchat was created by the devil himself. <laughs> I've seen so many kids have so many heartbreaks and get into lots of trouble because things that they posted on Snapchat that they thought would disappear and didn't disappear. But here's something that's interesting. I had a client in my office a couple of years ago who was crying her eyes out when I walked in and I thought, oh my God, somebody for sure has died. She said to me, I lost a 372 day snap streak. Now back then I didn't even know what a snap streak was, but she was so upset because it was with the most popular girl at school. Now, if you don't know what a snap streak is, you can take a picture or send a text. It can be anything. It can be uh, the floor for all we care. As long as you send something to somebody once a day, you get a point. And if you do that every day for 300 days, you have a 300 day streak. Here was the saddest part. When I asked my client, what did your friend say? She said, I don't know. I don't talk to her. She was creating a snap streak with somebody that she actually doesn't have a real relationship with, but it was her only connection to the most popular girl in school. She was deriving her value and worth from her snaps. I've even had a client who went to rehab and paid a friend to keep her snaps going while she was away and didn't have her technology. Now, it's kind of like chasing likes. If you've ever gotten online and thought, oh, I wonder why so-and-so didn't like my post. It's the same thing, except we as adults have enough frontal lobe to say, oh my God, that doesn't mean anything. They probably haven't seen it or they just don't care. Or maybe they're just not on the media or who cares if they didn't like it or not. Kids don't have the frontal lobe to do that. And so they create a pseudo sense of identity based upon likes. They want to become an influencer because that means meaning to them. And in an online world, it does. 
but it really doesn't have a deep sense of identity development. Another way that it's causing anxiety is researchers have nicknamed it popcorn brain. And I thought this was quite interesting, but I, I really relate to this too, because you guys know when you're on technology or you're watching a really action packed movie, your neurons in your brain are just firing and firing and firing like popcorn. And when you leave the movie or you shut down your computer at night, it doesn't just stop. It takes about a half hour to two hours for all of those neurons to start calming down. But your brain gets used to that fast popping. This is why we are becoming less adept to handle the slower paces of life. When a movie doesn't get to the point fast enough, we get impatient. When somebody doesn't get to the point fast enough, we get really irritated because our brain is used to being on with plugged in to fast paced stream of information. Now, of course, a lot of us know that being on technology too late at night exposes your eyes to too much white light. So it tricks your brain into thinking it's still daylight, which means your brain won't produce melatonin. Melatonin is that natural chemical that you need to help you go to sleep. So it can cause sleep problems. What we're also seeing though, is there are kids who are rock stars on their video games. They've got all these points and all these territories and all these wins, but in real life, they make A's, B's and C's. Ugh, what's the purpose in this? They would rather be online. And that is a state that we call a modification, Mo excuse me, a motivation, where we don't have a, a real purpose in the real world. Being online is so much more fun to these kids because there are so much new novel stimuli, which unfortunately can cause techno tantrums. So I hope I'm going to be able to do this. Oh, I don't know if you can hear that. Let me just, um, Barb, is that press play? Can you hear him? No, ah, darn it. OK, there's a really and I don't know how to turn the share. On so that you can hear my. Um, video, but what I can do is put. Um, a link to this video, but it, it shows a young man who just had his video games taken away. And he has an incredibly terrible techno change room. So probably sees his little brother hid a video in his room. And this poor kid comes in and he's yelling and he's screaming and he says, I hate you, I'm running away, and throws a full on techno tantrum. This kiddo is 15 years old and he's losing his body posture. This goes on for minutes, minutes, minutes. You can probably find it online. It's a YouTube video now. Thanks to his cute little brother <laughs> who actually hid the video. But this poor kid is really dysregulated. But we're seeing this more and more and more. I'm actually helping more kids go off to treatment for rehab than I've ever seen before. And I'm also getting a lot of calls about kids who are failing to launch in college because they get into college they don't go to class, they spend all their time playing video games, and then they fail out and have to come home and get treatment. Now, the good news is in our country, they can get treatment, but in Chinese and Japanese cultures, many Asian cultures, it is actually a shame to reach out to a therapist. It's just not done. And so in Japan, they've given this diagnosis a name, Hikikimori syndrome and it's severe social withdrawal that is characterized by adolescents and young people becoming recluses in their parents' home. They fail to go to school, they don't go to work. Over a million kids have been diagnosed with this in Japan. Now in America, we call it video game addiction. And so here's a few pictures to show you what it might look like. It's really sad to me because their parents are too ashamed so they don't get them help and they just really become reclusive, wall them off or shut them off, bring in food, but they, they don't require anything of them. 
it makes me glad that in our country we at least talk about it and can get us help. But it's also important to remember that, you know, our technology creators are the culprit of this. Video game manufacturers have been hiring teen testers for decades, you guys. They hook them up to these brain machines to find out when they get spikes of chemicals in the brain that make them feel good. They record the code that that kid just played and report it back to the video game manufacturer. This is mass produced addiction. Our cell phones are the same way. A lot of the tech giants came forward about seven years ago, you might remember, and they said, we don't give technology to our kids because we know how addictive it is, but yet they're okay with us buying it for our children. Hmm. Well, here are some signs of severe video game addiction. It could be social media addiction, or it could be just surfing the internet kind of addiction. But we see if you've got one or two of these, you may need to start to make some changes. If you've got four to six of these, you're definitely gonna need to see a counselor. And if you have over six of them, you may have a kiddo or you yourself may suffer with a severe tech issue. Now, only about 9% of users ever meet criteria, and they're playing from between 20 and 50 hours per week, so it's pretty extreme, but it's really important, and there's a great website called netaddiction.com if you want to take a test or a quiz to see if you have any of the signs of addiction. All right, you guys, use it or lose it challenge number four. Does technology and social media affect our values and beliefs? Now, I've seen more and more couples coming in very upset at how much time their spouse spends on a computer, feeling jealous, feeling left out. Kids complain all the time to me about how much their parents are on their phones. And we've seen a rise in accidents on playgrounds and at home because parents are distracted. We see kids that are not learning communication skills like they should because they just don't talk as much and listen as much. And of course, you know, everything is not insta wonderful. You can be like, oh my God, I've had such a great Saturday night, but then this is really what you did. I'm a rock god, everything's wonderful, but this is really what you look like. We don't post the unpolished pictures. We polish us up and then post that online so that we look better. We don't post the bad days, we just post the happy days. So it gives people the impression that we're supposed to be happy all the time and that there really shouldn't be bad days. This is not a lesson that we really wanna teach our kids. And more and more young people are going to plastic surgeons because they want nose jobs. But they wanna look the way they look when they use filters on social media. Now here is a study that is so scary to me that illustrates how it changes our values and beliefs. This is a picture of a person who's drunk driving. They showed this picture to a group of adolescents with six likes, and this is what they saw in most of the brain scans. What you notice is there's a lot of activity back here in the occipital lobe, which is the lobe that we use to see the world from, but not much in the other parts of the brain. And when you ask these kids, what do you think about this picture? Of course, they give you snarky answers like, well, duh, this is a bad idea, don't do it. But look what happens when you increase the amount of likes. Ugh, lots of activity going on. And when you ask these kids, all right, what are you thinking? Your frontal lobe is lighting up, so is your limbic system. They say, well, I'm really trying to look at this picture to figure out, is anything changed? It's the same picture. More people like it. So maybe it's not so bad after all. Ah, no. We have to watch what our kids are watching online and make sure that just because somebody likes a post about risky behavior, that they don't like it too, just to go along with the crowd. All right, use it, lose it, challenge number five. What effect? does gaming have on the developing brain, specifically gaming? So here's what we know. In young people under the age of 18, the more exposure they have to violent media, first person shooter video games, the more aggressive they become. The more they bully on the 
plague, the more anxiety, the more desensitized they get to aggression. Now here's the good news. When they stop playing those games, those behaviors go down. So there really is a causal link here. What your brain sees, it repeats. This is a study that is really illustrating, illustrative of the effect that it has on our executive functioning skills, specifically the skill of empathy. So this was a, a study that was done in college age men, 18 to 21. What they had them do was the group, the control group did not play any video game and they came in and did three brain scans while they were taking an empathy test. So the researchers would give them scenarios and ask them, come up with a way to show empathy to this person. So each time they were different, they compared those brain scans to a group of young men who played Call of Duty Modern Warfare two hours a day for two weeks. Now you can see on baseline, both brains look pretty much the same. There's lots of activity in the frontal lobe for each kid, which means the part of the brain that does show empathy is on. But look at the violent video game players. You can see a significant difference in brain activity in the guys who were playing the violent video games. Now the cool thing about this study is they actually asked the kids, hey, why do you think this is? And they said, well, you know, I've got to dumb down my empathy. Like I can't have empathy and go be killing people in first person shooter games all the time. That's scary because what if they keep doing that two hours a day all the way up until the age of 25? If their frontal lobe is not growing those long strings of neurons, it's gonna lose them and they may not have enough empathy to have really fulfilling relationships as an adult. All right, here's another issue that is really lighting up parent groups all over the world. These game companies are using gamblification, which is combining the mechanics of gambling with social media and video games to entice more players to spend more money. So they use things like it's free to play and once you get in you can't go farther unless you pay some money or you can't access a certain thing unless you pay some money and these are really called predatory monetization schemes designed just to get you to spend money these games keep track of your information your preferences how much money you have in the game your your habits so they know exactly when to change the game so that you'll buy money. It's really not anything to do with your skill, but it has a whole lot to do with the company and how skilled they are in getting you to spend money. There's also these little microtransactions that you think, oh, it'll no big deal. I'll spend 99 cents to get a new skin or to level up or to buy a virtual item. But what's really, really sad is the amount of people who actually spend money on this are children. They take advantage of kids because those are the ones who buy the most things online in microtransactions. Now, the last thing too that you've got to really teach your kids to watch out for is loot boxes. What I would suggest is that kids should not buy them at all because it really is gambling. You never know if your desired outcome is going to be in one of these loot boxes. So you have to buy one or two or three. You have to up your odds to see if you get more chances. If this were real money, it would be against the law because that is technically gambling. And so there are a lot of parent groups that have signed petitions and gotten bills in Congress to try to get loot boxes out of video games because they are really an addictive technique that these companies use. All right, you guys, here is the last use it or lose it challenge. Can you see your graduation cap? The question here is, how do we balance our brain as it's growing and developing? What do we do to achieve this balance? So let's talk about some solutions. And this is not one of them. Do not do this. Do not expose your babies to screens until they are at least 18 months to two years of age. This is very damaging to a young brain. They are not capable of being able to process all of this fast moving stimuli. 
definitely don't buy a tablet potty trainer. No, don't do this. We don't want to see this. No, we definitely don't want to see this. This is what we want to see. Lots of face to face fun activities, playing together, being together as a family. You can use the activity pyramid, which can help you figure out what type of activity and how many times a week you need to do it with screen time being what we want you to cut down on. We also want you to save time for daydreaming. Take tech free weekends with your family and your kids. Even if it's like four hours, we're all going to go to the beach and we're, we're going to leave our cell phones in the car. I agree that I'm going to go camping this weekend and I'm going to take my camera, not my cell phone camera, so that I can leave my cell phone at home. Always make sure you teach kids how to have conflict, good communication skills. Don't let them avoid those things because they're avoiding them more and more and more. The better communication skills, the more conflict management, the better they will be when they get into the workforce. Also, finish what you started. Clean your child's desk off so they have less distractions. Make sure that you turn their cell phone off at the router while they're doing their homework. Make sure that cell phones get turned off at least a half an hour or two hours before bedtime so their brain has a chance to rest and go to sleep. Here are the American Pediatric Society screen guidelines. I actually have them in my book, but you can also go onto the APS's website and find these. It'll show you how many hours per day are recommended for what particular age group and what kind of screen time that we should be giving. Too many times we are guilty of using digital babysitters, but it's not healthy for their brain. When your child is old enough to earn technology, it should come with a contract. I have a great smartphone contract in my book, but every single tablet, computer, cell phone should always come with a contract. This is one of my favorites that says, in this house, technology is a privilege, not a right, and all technology must be parent approved which means you can take it away at any time. No technology at the dinner table or behind closed doors. More kids are getting into pornography younger and younger today because they have access to it. And here's a few parenting tools that yes, are online, but my favorite one is Bark. This one right here, because you can install it on all your kids' devices and it will watch your kids' behavior online by using an algorithm. I wouldn't rely solely on it. I would check and let your kids know that you check to see what they're posting, what they're saying, how they're acting, what they're looking up. And if your child looks up pornography, it'll send you a notification. If your child sends a message to a friend that they're feeling suicidal, it'll send you that. This company also keeps up with all the acronyms that kids use. So if they send the language, like the parent free kind of language to get away with it, Mark will catch it. It's important to ask, actually, uh, Teen Safe has a really great program that you can install on your kid's phone when they start driving that will track them throughout the city. It will also track if they're texting and driving or if they're going over the speed limit. And then there are also uh, quite a few things that you can use to help you watch and monitor kids time online. Remember you guys, you got to be their frontal lobe until they have a frontal lobe of their own. They're not old enough to say no to all the temptations that they have online. You got to be the one to do that. So here is my book, The Neuro Whereabouts Guide, and the Spanish version is out. Guía de la Neuro Localización is available on Amazon. Please feel free to go ahead and purchase one, but of course your time here today will earn you a spot in the raffle to get a copy. I'll just need to know what language that you want it in. If you would like to email me or call me, my information is there and I would be happy to take any questions for you as always. All right, Barb, I'm going to hand it back over to you. Are we doing question and answer tonight? Yes, yes, we are. So I wanted to check and see um, if there were questions that folks had. Jonathan, if you can help in checking there. Oh, and hopefully can pull that back up. Um, I think it's still trying to share yours. Oh, Let's see if I, I got it. There we go. There we go. 
And so um, while we're looking and Jonathan, if you can check for me too, for the questions from our families, but as a parent of a 15 year old, <laughs> I too <laughs> have questions. I love the contract, but when I look at the, um, the video you were trying to show, and I'm sure many other parents can relate to this, yeah. <laughs> That's terrifying when you uh, attempt to implement if you didn't have something like the contract in a, you know laid out before they got access to technology. So how do you effectively remove technology or create um, those uh, that balance, as you said, two hours of this, and then you can have two hours? Like what what recommendations or guidance sure. do you if have? If you start them when they're younger, the tech the Techno tantrum lasts for a shorter period of time. And just because they're having a techno tantrum doesn't mean that what you're doing is wrong or not working. Because kids have temper tantrums, adults have temper tantrums. That is an extreme temper tantrum caused by a parent who was inconsistent with the rules and a kiddo who also has behavioral problems. So it was an extremely bad one, but I've seen pretty bad techno tantrums in, you know, 13, 14, 15, 16 year old kids who are withdrawing from technology because they have an addiction. And so what we do is we don't ever, ever, ever give in when they're having a techno tantrum. We just clear, just steer clear of them, make sure that they are not going to hurt themselves and only talk to them when they've calmed down. Then do a lot of praise when they've come. Thank you for coming down. I really appreciate that. And if they say, can I have my technology back? And you say no, and they have another temper tantrum, then you quietly leave the scene. If they try to follow you, leave the house. If it gets to that extreme, you're going to need to find a counselor that can help with that. Because that kind of shaping of behavior will take months and potentially need some more intensive treatment. But if it's just uh, letting a kiddo know, hey, this is the rule. You're on for two hours. You got to go do something else with your brain for two hours. If you enforce that rule and remove the technology, they are forced to go do something else. And once they figure it out, a lot of times kids will be like, oh my God, I don't know what to do. I'm bored. And you can just say, hey, the activity pyramids on the fridge, go pick something out. That's your responsibility, not mine. And then when they do pick something out and they go enjoy it, then you can come back and say, you know what? I am really proud of you. You went and picked something out on your own. You did that on your own. I'm so proud. What a great job uh, for you problem solving and making a decision. Now they probably were like, I would have rather had my technology. It doesn't matter if you get that snarkiness back. What you want is to slowly shape the behavior so that they're balancing out the brain and getting them help if they're in trouble. Thanks. Um, another question around technology and schooling right now with so many kids working at, at school using technology at home, doors are closing to create separate spaces. Um, how do you set those guidelines so you a child has what they need to be working on schoolwork, but they could be doing other things because the doors close. <laughs> yeah, well, that's when you do spot checks and you walk in and you look over like and if they quickly click out, then you want to look at their history. You're just going to want to spot check them. And if kids say what you don't trust me, I want you to say, you know what? I trust the part of your brain that's grown and developed. I just don't trust the part that's not. I'm just doing my job. And then that's when you use technology like Bark, because if you have that software on your kids program, you're going to know immediately when they go do something that they shouldn't be doing. But if you want to, you know, uh, just check once in a while and then reward them when they're finished. Also make sure that technology turns off at a specific time mm -hmm. and you can say, look, your your computer goes off at 10 o'clock at night. It's bedtime. Well, what if I haven't done homework? Well, the next time you better plan a little bit better. That kind of consequence will really help them learn how to plan and organize their time better if they know it goes off at a certain time. And sometimes if you use like Disney Circle has a really great thing where you can turn it off at the Wi-Fi when they, you know, especially if they won't. But that does mean that you as a parent need to be vigilant 
can have a cell phone basket where it all goes or you take up technology and it charges in your room. Whatever you can do, it does take a lot of work to get this done, but it's really important. You wouldn't give a bag of cocaine to a 10 year old. Now, why would you give a 10 year old access to the World Wide Web with no, no checks and balances? It's the same thing because they can be exposed to so many addictive things online and so many dangerous things that we don't want them to see or do. So you've got to jump in and be able to um, monitor. Great question. Um, any other questions while we have Dr. Collier with us? Don't be shy. Hi, Dr. Collier, this is Jonathan. One of the questions is, are there any recommended time limits for technology outside of being online in class? Yes, that's a really great, great question. And so uh, a good rule is when your kids are in elementary school, they should not have recreational tech time during the week. It should really be earned on the weekend. So if a child has behaved well, they can earn a half hour on the weekend. In middle school, they could have um, um, or, or in half hour increments up to two, no more than three hours consecutively. Now, middle schoolers could have uh, earn an hour or two at a time, but when they get to that four hour mark, they need to go do something else with their brain. And then, of course, they can potentially earn like half hour here or half hour there during the week. If you can try to keep recreational screen time out of the week, and I'm not talking about TV, I'm talking about video games and social media and things like that. If you can relegate it to the weekend, that's good. But if you already have teenagers that are using it any time, then what I recommend is that you say you have to balance. You got to get off because you've been on all day and go do something else. And, and, and it, the more you set that rule and consistently follow it with them, the better. Uh, but for high schoolers, really no more than one hour per day of rec screen time during the day. They really need to be out and doing other things. And then on the weekends, no more than four hours consecutively each day of the weekend. That's still eight hours of screen time for the whole weekend. But if you use the balance rule, then they'll also be doing something else healthy with their brain for eight hours. You may have to help them figure out what that is or drive them to it, but it's definitely worth it. Thanks, Jonathan. And you mentioned the pyramid that you post. Yes, you Is can actually find that online. The University of Mississippi gave me, or sorry, Missouri gave me um, permission to put that in my book, uh, but it's actually online. You can get it for free, or you can go to my website, theneurowhereaboutsguide.com and download it for free there. Got it. Um, you, you mentioned how you feel about Snapchat that came that came through um, other social media and thinking about that age guidance. Um, I know that each each of them has some parameters for how old you must be to set up an account and we know that children lie about how old they are to get on. So I'm curious any other tips for parents around social media to steer clear of or age guidance. So I uh to make sure that you have the rule, no downloading an app unless I have given you permission. And if you do a spot check on your kid's phone and see that they have downloaded apps without your permission, I recommend that they lose that technology for two weeks. Even if that means you have to call the school and find out and tell them where to pick you up, it's really critical for them to have the loss of that technology occur when they abuse it. Gotcha. Well, I know that's probably uh, all the time we have as we want to respect people's time in the evening. Once again, so grateful. This will be recorded and made available. And thank you to those who attended. You will have the opportunity to get a copy of Dr. Collier's book. I think I need one in English and Spanish for my okay. library. Barb, can I pop in? Because I just saw a question that uh -huh. I'd love to answer before sure. we jump off. It says, I've been considering getting digital books, but I'm scared of the impact it may have on my eight-year-old and my five-year-old. 
Does it make a difference using books via digital or it does not actually make a difference if it's digital or non digital, except that you can't highlight it or write in it. And so I think that I would try to help your kids by still asking them and giving them real books. But if they will read more by getting a digital book, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. All right, you guys, thank you so much for having me again. It's been great. Barb, appreciate agree, it. Agree, agree. Thank you all so much. Have a wonderful evening and look forward to seeing you next week for behavior and modification. All right. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, guys. See you next week. <laughs>